Calvary is also the redemptive work of the Messiah. Somebody say he put his life on it. I need y'all to talk with me today. Say he put his life on it. Get this. Get this. Our redemption is effective already. Our redemption is, a, is effective already. Some of us are re waiting for redemption. But our redemption is effective already. Somebody say already. Christ is our redeemer from all iniquity. But not only from all our iniquity, but also from death. And he is our redeemer without money. I say he's our redeemer from all iniquity. Say all iniquity. From death without money. Now to further appreciate redemption, we got to understand the requirement of the kinsman. Amen. So to understand redemption in the way that is truly to be understood, we got to understand the requirement and appreciate the requirement of the kinsman. Now, Hebraic culture dictates that certain relation requires redemption. Certain relation requires redemption. Amen. If you're related in a, a specific kind of way in the Hebraic culture at this day and time that the text comes out of or what I'm about to disclose to you, that there's a requirement on the relative depending on your proximity to the person in the relation, that you are required to redeem. I want to take you to my favorite book. I'm not going to read uh, directly, but I want to take you to one of my favorite books in the Bible, the book of Ruth. And in chapter 4, we find that Ruth can be redeemed by another person. She has another person, another relative that can redeem her. And we know that Boaz is in the background and he brings this attention. He brings this to the attention of the relative and he says, I need you to understand that our good sister here, my friend, Ruth, uh, Naomi, her mother-in-law, has bought a certain, part, sold a certain uh, parcel of land that belonged to our dear brother, our dearly departed brother, that is, Emelech. And you can redeem it, but you need to redeem it right about now. Because if you don't redeem it, then I will. Amen? And it is at this that the other relative... The other relative, here's the extent of the cost to redeem. I said the extent of the cost to redeem because the first thing he tells him about is the land. And everybody, even today, if I offer you some land, most people will take on the land. But when I tell you what's tied to the land, you might not want to take on what's tied to the land. And when he hears what's tied to the land, what happens is he thinks that Ruth is not worth the redemption. Never mind. I said he thinks that Ruth is not worth the redemption. See, the land didn't do nothing. But when he heard about Ruth, he was like, I don't, I don't want to mar. The text says that he doesn't want to mar his own inheritance. Oh, but there's one that will. Amen. There's one that will. I need you to understand this, that Ruth was a Moabitess. Amen. Now, Moab is the result of incest, a gross and inordinate relationship. Amen. This is the result. This is how Moab came to be. Y'all all right with that? Now, Moab grows to be a perennial enemy of Israel. This is who Moab is. Moab is cursed. 
Moab is shut out from the congregation of the Lord. This is who Moab is. So Moab seems shut out almost altogether of redemption. Amen. Ruth is a Moabitess. Cursed. Shut out from the congregation of the Lord. A prodigal and inordinate relationship. A prodigal and inordinate relationship. Ruth is now a widow. I just not, can I talk to y'all about Ruth for a little bit? Ruth is a widow, and her mentor is a bitter widow. I said that Ruth is a widow, and her mentor is a bitter widow. Now, famine and death have drove them to their current location and their current situation. Amen? If Ruth would have had a smartphone back in the day, she might have took a selfie or she might have took a ussy with Naomi and she would have been like, our current situation is famine and death. Amen? This was their current situation. Ruth is an outsider. She's destitute. She doesn't have a covering. You have to understand the culture that women didn't have rights back then. So a woman without a, a widow without a husband was really left to her own, her own uh, doings. Amen. She was left to her own devices. She had to do it for herself. Amen. Uh, we think that single mothers have it bad now. Oh, you ain't want to be a widow back then. Amen. Having no rights, being in a patriarchal society. So she's without a covering. And then to make matters even worse, she's moved to this new place where she's an outsider. And she's got a low-paying job. I can't talk to nobody. I think that the Old Testament don't talk right now. She's got a low-paying job. Her occupation is gleaning the leavings and the scraps of harvest. This is what her job is. This is what her occupation is. She's already experienced death. Her, her mentor is bitter. She's an outsider. And her occupation is to glean the leavings and the scraps of harvest. Anybody ever felt that you've been left to the scraps? But little did she know that one decision was about to seal her redemption. I said that one decision was about to seal her redemption. Am I talking to anybody? Somebody say, pick up the crumbs. I don't think that you heard me. I say, pick up the crumbs. No, see, what had happens is, see, what had happens is that we'd gone looking for loaves, but the path came by way of breadcrumbs. I need you to know where she's wound up because she's come from a foreign land into the house of bread. And see what had Bethlehem, y'all. Let me catch you up. I said, Bethlehem, she's come to the house of bread looking for loaves because she's experiencing famine, but she can't find I know lows in the house of bread. All she can find is breadcrumbs, but the breadcrumbs are a trail. See, sometimes because we don't see the big things, we miss the small things, and we begin to despise the small things when the word of God says, despise not small beginnings. Because her beginnings are small. They're minuscule. She has to look for them. They're not obvious. And let me tell you the truth about the matter. She's a Moabitess. And she actually does not have right to glean there. She's gleaning in a place that she has no right. Yet she finds favor. She finds favor in the field because she's willing to pick.
pick up the crumbs. Anybody in this house willing to pick up the crumbs? We'll say and we're not out here, yeah, I'm ready to pick up the crumbs. But it's a hard thing to pick up the crumbs when you see the hardest. Man, man, am I talking to anybody here? It's hard to pick up the crumbs when you've seen the harvest. It's not like she's not in the place of harvest. Anybody been in the place of harvest, but you wasn't reaping the harvest, you was reaping crumbs. It seemed like everybody else around you had things, had what they needed, and you were left to pick up the crumbs. And if you and I be truthful with each other, that we were upset that we had to stoop down so low to pick up the crumbs. We despised the crumbs that we had to pick up. And little did you know that God was leading you to strength. Never mind. Because even though her mentor is bitter, her mentor is also pleasant. Amen. Now, Ruth, her name means friend. Amen. Now, Mara, which is what I was insinuating in the dialogue there, the monologue there rather that we were just discussing is that Mara was the ill-appropriated identity that Naomi had took on due to the situation that she was facing. Some of us have taken on different names and allowed people to call us different names because of the situation that we were in. Somebody called you a failure and you accepted the name failure because of the situation that you were in. That wasn't your name, but that was the identity that you chose to identify with. And what happened was, even everybody was really still seeing Naomi. They had believed that Naomi was still, they were happy to see Naomi when they came in there, but she wasn't happy with ourselves. See, when you get into a place of depression, it doesn't matter what everybody else around you is saying. It only matters what's happening in your mind. And what was happening in her mind, Naomi was going through depression, y'all. I don't think that you hear me. Naomi was going through depression because even though everybody else was walking in her back, all she saw was bitterness. She saw so much bitterness that she said, Call me by what I'm experiencing instead of calling me by who I am. Because Naomi means pleasant. But Ruth May means friend. So once upon a time, she was a friend of Moab. Anybody understand what I'm saying? At one point in time, she was a friend of Moab. She used to be married to a man named Milhorn, and Milhorn's name means sickly, sickness. So at one point in time, she was a friend of sickness. Never mind. Now you're hearing what I'm telling you. I said she was a, a friend of, of sickness. And, and what happened was because she decided, she said, entreat me not to leave you. And she decided to go on this trail of breadcrumbs with a person who called themselves bitter. But she saw them as pleasant. But she befriended. So she was a friend of bitterness. But she wouldn't leave her mentor, and her mentor was pleasant. Then she was redeemed by strength to become a friend of God. She found redemption. She found redemption from obedience at the foot. Of strength. I wish that you heard what I just said. I said she found redemption at the foot of strength because what happened was is that the pleasant side of Naomi told her after she had been gleaning in that field for so long, she said, Look, get strength to play the part or accept the part. And of the kinsman, go and lay at his feet 
Go and lay at his feet. Is anybody here desperate enough for God to lay at his feet? Anybody out here want God so bad that I'll just lay at his feet? Because what you have to understand is Boaz is a type and shadow of Christ. And, and he strength, his name means strength. And what she does is lay at the feet of strength. And when strength found out that he could have a friend, when strength found out that he could have a friend, he was going to stop at nothing. Naomi knew strength so well, even in her bitterness. Never mind. I said even in her bitterness. Man, am I talking to anybody in here? Even in her bitterness, she knew strength so well. She knew that strength was a man of his word. She knew that strength would not tell her a lie. She knew that strength would redeem his friend. And so even though Naomi, I'm a brother Ruth, is young in the faith, she's just now learning how to walk. Because she really doesn't know. She said, you know people, that means that that she had known this before. Your people will be my people. Wherever you stay, I'm going to stay. And most importantly, your God will be my God. Because you got to understand that her God previous to this time wasn't the God of Naomi. It was the God of Moab. And even though Moab, his name doesn't have a direct meaning, some literature leads us to begin that uh, some literature begins to make us believe that his name means something like who's your daddy. <laughs> who's your daddy? This is where Ruth has an issue. Who's your daddy? She dismisses the issue and chooses another father. She leaves her daddy for a father. So she comes out, and now she's become this friend of God. And she's become this friend of strength, all due to even though being young in the faith, she was just obedient. You don't have to be deep when you're obedient. You don't have to be deep when you're obedient. You don't have to be profound when you're obedient. You ain't got to be real red when you're just being obedient. All you got to do is follow instruction. Somebody tell us how to do something nowadays. Somebody ask one of these ratchet uh, 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 entities out here, uh, go lay at his feet, darling, and he'll redeem you. No, I ain't laying at nobody's feet. He working construction. He work out in the field. You know what kind of feet that he got? I ain't laying at his feet. Feet probably stink. I know he's supposed to be strong. Well, the smell from his toes is awfully strong. Some of us won't go low to get higher. Amen. But then, somebody say, but then. But then she belonged to strength. Man, I wish y'all heard this like I'm trying to say it to you. Then she belonged to strength. See, first she sought after strength. But then she belonged to him. First she sought after strength. But then she belonged to him. See, we've been seeking after God so that we can belong to him. And when we realize that we belong to him, we realize also that he belongs to us. It's a mutual agreement. It's a covenant. Say, I belong to him. That means I no longer belong to Moab. I no longer belong to sickness. I no longer belong to death and famine. 
But now I belong to strength. And strength belongs to me. Get this. Get this. Leave your lineage and follow your inheritance. Leave your lineage and follow your inheritance. What are you talking about? See, she had another lineage before she came into relationship with strength. And she, just like her sister Orpha, had a choice to make between going back to what she was used to and going with something that was Let's call it peculiar. Something that was a little different. Didn't quite know what all was going to take place, but went on anyway. Is that all right to anybody? Let's talk about redemption from death. Let's go to the whole see of chapter 13, verse 14. Hosea, chapter 13, verse 14. In this chapter, as you're turning, it addresses the direct idolatry of Ephraim. But it's also inclusive of Israel. And what had happened to Israel is the same thing that happens to you and I that is happening in today's Israel. They had become, hear me when I say this closely, they had become subjects of error. If we are subjects of error, that means that we are subject to error. They had become subjects of, they, they begin idol worship. They were kissing the calves. That's in your text. They were kissing the calves. God reminds them that I, I, you were known to me in the wilderness. You were known to me in the wilderness, yet you sought the kings of carnality. You sought kings of carnality. And then you had already been foretold of redemption in Egypt. I told you when you were in Egypt that I was going to redeem you. Verse 14 says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh, death, you got to understand the way that the Messiah is set up. You got to understand the way that God is set up. God is so powerful and Christ is so powerful that even before the day has come, he's already talking trash to death. He says, oh, death, I will be thy plague. Oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. The way that I'm about to destroy death, I'm not going to even repent for it. Amen? David, the writer in Psalms, realizes this in Psalms 49 and 15, and he says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. Selah. The same text of Hosea is the same place where Corinthians 15 and 55 find the writer Paul quoting the scripture, using the scripture as a reference. And he says, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Amen. I want you to know today that you've been redeemed from death. I want to talk to you now if I could 
redemption without money. Somebody say without money. Mm. Isaiah 52 verse 3. Isaiah 52 verse 3. The word has been sent to rouse up Zion to be clothed in beautiful garments. Free from the dust of being trampled over. To be enthroned. And to be released from bondage. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Amen. We have been redeemed before we could sell ourselves out or we can sell ourselves short. Amen. Short regarding the standards and the expectations of others. Anytime we try and live up to the expectations of others, we've already sold ourselves short. Amen. Anytime we try to live up to somebody else's standards, we've already sold ourselves short. Amen. And he redeemed us before we had an opportunity to sell ourselves out from our purpose, out from our destiny, amen, out of our power. He redeemed us already. See, he's telling the people in the book of Exodus that I'm going to redeem you. So they're waiting on redemption. And he's telling the people in the book of Isaiah that I'm about to redeem you without money. And he's telling them in the book of Hosea that I'm going to redeem you from death. But when we look at the book of Titus, our redemption has already come. You and I don't have to wait on redemption anymore. Somebody give God praise right there. Somebody say without money. Understand all currency has the expiration date of its society. All currency has the expiration date of its society. Amen. It may hold a little value, but it's not worth what it was before. It's not worth anything if it's paper money. If it's paper money, just go ahead, burn it, keep yourself warm. This is what they were doing in certain wars when the money had become so inflated. They were using the money to make fires. Am I right about it? They were literally burning money. Our money is still worth something and some of us still burn it. But they were burning their money because it had no worth. Amen. So all currency has the expiration date of its society. But the kingdom is eternal. The kingdom is eternal. We understand that? Somebody say amen. Get this. Whenever we question our worth, we depreciate the redemptive work. I'll say that one more time. Whenever we question our worth, we depreciate the redemptive work. Every time you're challenging your worth and you're saying, I'm not worth it. And we've been taught in church errantly to say that I'm not worthy. Hold on, wait a minute. I'm not up to the task. I don't know why he called me. Every time you're doing that, you're depreciating the redemptive work. Because you got to know how much you are worth to God. You were worth, you and I were worth so much to God that he sent his only begotten son. His only begotten son thought so much of you and I that he put his life on it. Say he put his life on it. Do you understand that Christ, that Adonai, that Adonai lays down his eternity, comes into time, comes into mortality. So that he can give his life. 
how many of us could put up anything to come and help somebody else? He lays down an eternity. He says, hold eternity up for me right here. I'm going to come into mortality so that I can give my life. He thought that much of you and I to lay down his life. So don't challenge your worth. Look at your neighbor and say, don't challenge your worth. Tell that person sitting next to you, say, you're worth it. I would that you would celebrate God right there, that you're worth it. I shouldn't have to cajole you into and conjure you to a place to understand that you're worth it. Some of us haven't done the things that we've been called to do because we don't think that we're worth it. We don't think that we're worth it when we think that we don't have enough. I don't have enough experience. I don't have enough finances. I don't have enough people. I'm not worth it. I don't have a good enough voice. God has been teaching me something even inside my own gifting. And my part, I can tell you about this. What I happen is I don't like the sound of my own voice. So in doing the thing that God has called me to do, I disguise my own voice so that I can take the sound of it. Y'all don't. I wish that you would hear me. I said, I disguise my natural voice so that I can sound how I want to sound. That's what I've been telling him lately. I say, like, I've got to learn how to do this thing in my own voice. Never mind. Maybe your gifting is not speaking. But what has happened is that we don't think that our voices are worth being heard. So we disguise our voice with the voice that we want to hear. We disguise our dance with the dance that we're supposed to give. We disguise our gift with the gift that we want to give because we don't think that the gift and the voice and the talent and the power that we've been given is worth it. How many people can be honest with me and just admit I've been masquerading my gift for far too long. I've been masquerading my talent for far too long. I've been masquerading my power for far too long. I've been masquerading what God has given me for far too long. I've been trying to do it. But I've been trying to do it like somebody else. I've been having a Mara moment. I've been acting like something that I wasn't due to the experiencing that I was going through. I didn't like the sound of my own voice, so I tried to change it to sound like this. When this is not how God designed me to talk, I have to strain to talk like this. You don't understand what I have to go through to get this voice so I can sign grime when I do my thing. Uh, I'm not talking about preaching. I'm talking about the other thing that I do. Because I like the sound right about right here. Because this sound real grimy. And this sound, God was like, since when did I call you to sound grimy? Since when did I call you to sound grimy? If you got a high-pitched voice, then go ahead and talk with your high-pitched voice. And he says, look, you don't have a low register because I didn't want you to have one. I wish somebody would understand that I'm flipping the meaning of register there. I didn't want you to have a low register. I didn't want you to have a medium register. I want you to have a high register. Never mind. I want you to have a high register. Is that all right with anybody? Somebody say without money. I got to get back to what I was talking about. Don't question your worth. Whatever God has given you, Whatever God has told you, we've been hearing so many times that he's already equipped us with it. 
what he has to say he has. Our worth is determined not only by Christ's willingness to redeem us, but his performance of it. Amen? Now, side note, understand, understand that the objective of the enemy is theft and not purchase. The enemy will never try to redeem you. He will only try to steal you. He will only come to abduct you. Wherein God will come to adopt you. Our redemption is effective already. Redemption from iniquity. Redemption from death. Redemption without money. Somebody say he put his life on it. Now turn it around and say he put his love on it. John 15, 13 says, what greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. You got to understand that the reason why Boaz wasn't afraid to redeem Ruth is because he was willing to lay down his life for a friend. that right there. Y'all got to marinate and pick that up. You understand what I'm saying? He was willing. The other man wouldn't redeem it because he had to lay down. He said, I might mar my inheritance. I'm not willing to lay down my life for this Ruth person whose name means friend. I'll do it for the land, but I won't do it for my friend. See, the enemy is always trying to snatch up your territory but don't want you. Never mind. The enemy will always come to snatch your territory, but doesn't want you. He only wants your position. The enemy is not interested in you. He only wants your position in the house of God. That's why you will be alive and you'll be in the church, but you won't really be connected with God. Because he's taking your position. Amen. That's what he wants. He wants your position. He wants your influence. Because that's how he works. The reason why the enemy messed with you so bad is because he wants your position. Because you got influence over somebody. You got influence over your children. You got influence over your co-workers. And he won't show influence because he understands that you are an influential person. All he needs to do is influence you to influence others. Without your position, he couldn't influence other people. And trust me, when he can't get you, he gets somebody else that has a position in your, never mind, that has a position in your life. Hebrews 9, 12 expresses, he gave himself for us with his own blood, obtaining eternal redemption. Our redemption is effective already. Some are waiting to release a word that is only captive by the bands that have already been loosed. Some are waiting to release a witness that is only captive by the bands that are already loosed. Some are waiting to release a work that is only captive by the bands that have already been loosed. Our redemption is effective already. Purified. Peculiar. Zealous of good works. I need you to realize on today, say my redemption is effective already. That means that whatever 
God has called for me to release into this world. It's up to me to remove the bands. The bands have already been loosed, but we have to take them off. Redemption was already ready for Ruth, but she had to lay at the feet. The things that we're waiting for already exist. Am I talking to somebody? The things that we've been seeking already exist. They don't have to be creative. Man, I wish I was talking to somebody. Nobody has to make them up. Hey Amen. It's not some new invention that has to happen. They say it already exists. Can you follow the breadcrumbs? Some of us have been in church a long time and understand why we still don't have certain understanding. And we're like, God, I don't know if I'm ever going to get it. And I want something more. Anybody really desire something more of God? If you've been desiring something more of God, I want to ask you a question. Have you been picking up the crumbs? Are you willing to pick up the crumbs? So that as you're picking up the crumbs and you learn how to digest the crumbs, when you get the loaf, you won't choke on it. When you get a slice, you won't choke on it. Amen? Somebody say, follow the breadcrumbs. Isn't it wonderful how God showed, showed his friend how to get to the house of bread and really be inducted into the house of bread by the scraps of harvest. You've been experiencing, it seems like everybody else has gotten something, but you haven't yet. And it feels like you've been left with the scraps. But I'm telling you that the harvest, and I'm speaking this prophetically over your life, if you will allow it, that the scraps that you've been gleaning for this season of your life are bringing you the strength. And strength is about to belong to you. I don't think that you just heard me. I said strength is about to belong to you. Strength is about to belong to you. And when strength patrols you, strength is never leaving you. From a place of obedience. From a place of obedience. When we are redeemed by strength, and when we come into intimacy with strength, the only thing that it's going to produce is more obedience. I wish somebody knew the word. The only thing that's going to happen when you're obedient and you come into covenant with strength, all you're going to do is produce more obedience. Because my friend marries strength. And she produces obey, the root word of obedience. And see, the root word of obedience begats another child named Jesse. And Jesse begats another child named my beloved, David. And see, out of the house of David, is where the Satan, it was the crumbs. It was the things that nobody expected. See, everybody thought that it was going to come out of Levi. Never mind. Everybody thought it was going to come out of Levi because they were looking for the loaves. When it was not in the loaves, it was in the crumbs. And see, the first crumb that got left was at the prophetic word of one of the patriarchs that said, Judah. 
your brothers will praise you. Do, do y'all know that out of Judah, down the line comes our Savior. But Judah was a crumb that led to a loaf. That is the living bread. Savior has redeemed us already. Don't wait to be released. You've already been released. Don't wait to be redeemed. You've already been redeemed. Stop calling yourself unworthy. Stop thinking that you're not worthy. Say he put his life on it. Say he put his love on it. I've been redeemed already. If you've been redeemed already, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In this season, you're not picking up crumbs anymore because you're betrothed to his strength. In this season, because you're betrothed to his strength. Strength belongs to you. Somebody celebrate God and say, strength belongs to to me, I'm not going to be weak anymore. I'm not going to experience famine anymore. I'm talking about in the spirit. I'm not going to experience death anymore. I'm not going to experience sickness anymore. I belong to strength. Catch this. Catch this. Catch this. Catch this. Healing is the children's bread. Say, I belong to the bread house I found my strength in the bread house I found my strength in the bread house I got there by crumbs but I got my strength in the bread house does anybody in this place want to lift their hands celebrate their savior celebrate our God give God the glory that I belong to strength you redeem me from all my iniquity you redeem me from death you redeem me from all of my faults. You redeem me from all of my sickness. You redeem me from all of my failure. You redeem me from all of my pain. You redeem me from all of my anguish. You redeem me from all my wickedness. You redeem me from all my rebellion. You redeem me. You thought I was worth saving. was worth saving. He thought that you were worth saving. I don't know where you came from. You might have come from inordinate relationships. You might have came from a cursed place and a cursed existence. But God still wants you to be his friend. He thought enough of us to redeem us. I want you to know that you're standing in the place of advantage. Oh, my God. You're standing in the place of advantage. 
And the reason that you are now standing in the place of advantage is because he's already done this. They were waiting on redemption. We already have redemption. Anybody want to be rated R? Let the redeemer of the Lord say it is so. Say it is so. Say it is so. It is so. It is so. I've been redeemed from all my iniquity. I've been redeemed from death. And I've been redeemed without money. Because I've been redeemed with the precious blood of our risen Savior. Our risen Savior, whom by his blood we are granted remission of sins, and he redeems us. Anybody want to be rated off? Give God a praise all over this place.